This is my Prusa. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Actually, this one is exactly like all the other ones out there, except that I put an E3D Revo in it because I needed uh, to review that hotend platform, and it is using a newer hotend fan shroud because I melted off the one that came with it. But it's still the printer that I actually use whenever I just need to print stuff. This one, on the other hand, it's seen some stuff, so we're gonna give it some TLC uh, that it certainly has earned. But I also kind of want to explain why I still prefer using this now five-year-old printer design over any of my newer printers that are honestly capable of printing parts every bit as good, if not better than the Prusa, and what manufacturers would need to do to finally win me over. All of that after a message from today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. There are plenty of VPN services around, but this is the one that I actually personally use. A while ago, I compared VPN providers and Private Internet Access ended up being the one that checked all the boxes for features like port forwarding, a no lock policy, and fast service without throttling or filtering, while also being one of the most affordable options. Private Internet Access hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection. This way, it shields your digital life from the eyes of your internet service provider, network administrators, and government sensors. The client is open source, but you can use any of your own OpenVPN or WireGuard compatible clients as well. Private Internet Access now has service in 84 countries and every single US state, so you can experience the internet as if you are practically anywhere in the world. And PIA does, of course, work with all your favorite streaming services. They've now offered our audience a special deal for Black Friday, 83% off, so it comes out to just about two bucks a month. And with a two year plan at this link, you'll get an extra four months for free. If you need it, they have 24 seven live chat support and you can try them risk-free with their 30 day money back guarantee. Thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. So yes, this is by today's standards, an ancient printer. In the same time that Prusa only released the Tweak Mark 3S and Mark 3S Plus machines that are still mostly identical to the original Mark 3, someone like Creality has put on over a dozen brand new machines, each one better than the last. That's sarcasm if you haven't noticed already. But yeah, the Mark 3 series is objectively lacking some of the features that other machines have, like networking with remote monitoring, uh, that Raspberry Pi Zero header thing uh, for Octoprint in the Mark III never really took off. They don't have an enclosed build space, they don't have the faster speeds that are achieved with input shaping. Those things I actually do miss, and other off-the-shelf printers are now more recently starting to ship with those features as default. On the other hand, the very visible stuff, like the you know monochromatic screen, it's text-based after all, or the headlining 8-bit MCU essentially from the 90s, those honestly don't bother me that much. Because on most machines that tout a 32-bit MCU, it's really just a cost-saving measure. The more modern MCUs are just cheaper. They're not doing anything with the extra horsepower though, and when they're running new buggy firmware on a 32-bit chip versus the endlessly tweaked version of Marlin that runs on these, well, then these are gonna make for a better experience overall. Unless you're doing real-time input shipping, which is set up, I, I do miss on these. I'm not sure if the motion platform would hold up to it, but still. Um, but yeah, unless you're doing that, these are plenty fast enough to run a 3D printer. The screen and the machines build, you know, they probably feel the most dated overall, but they work. There's no reason for injection molded and sheet metal parts everywhere. And the screen is really something you don't interact with that much. Load and unload filament, Star prints, that's really it. It's not nice, it doesn't look slick, but it fits in with the overall sort of DIY aesthetic. And for me, this just isn't a drawback in actually daily using the machine. And frankly, out of the machines that I own, this is the one that is the nicest to use in practice, which is why I use it. That's just a huge factor for me. I have a ton of machines that I test, and I don't have the time to tweak and upgrade and fine tune each and every single one. Otherwise, this channel would be entirely about end of three upgrades, which looking at how much interest there seems to be in those kind of videos, wouldn't actually be a bad direction for the channel. But I don't want to do that. I want to explore more than just one cheap printer. So when I try and test a new machine, I use them just as their God intended. In that case, with the manufacturer's profiles and recommendations, but otherwise, I just want something that reliably works. It's the same thing that 
phone reviewers come to in their conclusions when they had some fun with the newest OnePlus 12 Pro Ultra and they think it's pretty okay, but ultimately their SIM card goes straight back into the Pixel 5 for daily use or whatever other old phone they're using. My Ultimaker 3 has been sitting on the shelf after its fifth jam within a single spool of filament, which was the point that I got sick of cleaning out the nozzles. My CR30 would be super cool for automated printing, but getting parts to stick to the belt has been an absolute pain. And other printers which I actually genuinely liked, like the N3 V2 or the Neptune 2, they're not an upgrade over the old Prusa when it comes to how easy and how convenient they are to use overall. That boils down to the slicer that comes with heaps of profiles that are perfectly tuned to the printer. Uh, everything, you know, just working together as a unit. But also stuff like auto bed leveling and auto bed squaring coming as standard on the Prusas. You know, dimensional accuracy is pretty good on these machines. And you know, stuff like the PI flex plates being more thermally stable more reliable and so much easier to work with versus having to chisel off parts from the glass beds on the more budget oriented printers. It just adds up to more than the sum of its individual components. But you know, then why don't they use a Bamboo Labs machine or an Anker Make M5, which are printers that come with those features and then some? Well, I don't have either of those. Anker often are very strict when it comes to what the reviewers they work with are allowed to say. And Bamboo Labs are just not an established enough company yet that I feel confident to jump onto their very first printer and the hype that followed it. I mean, Kickstarter is a contentious topic to start with. They're just getting started and have just barely shipped the Kickstarter rewards, so I have no clue what sort of a company they'll end up being. That being said, there is a P1P on the way to me. Bamboo Labs are doing a lot of things that I agree with. They're using Prusa Slicer as their software, even if they have to be firmly poked to adhere to the open source license that comes under. Um, and at the very least, they seem to be great when it comes to encouraging honest reviews of their printers. Where I think so far they actually already beat out many other manufacturers is that they can just get spare parts for their machines if you ever need them without having to rely on questionable sources from AliExpress, where quality is a gamble at best. Instead, you can just get all the parts you might break outside of warranty straight from them at honestly super reasonable prices. Which implies that they're not designing the machines to be thrown out every two years for you to just buy the V2 or Pro model as the old one disintegrates. So speaking of replacement parts, I think it's time to get this sad Mark III fixed up and then have a bit of a look at where we've come from and where we're about to go when it comes to the state of the ready-built 3D printer market. Okay, we're back in business. We've now gotten rid of the uh, volcano and that weird third party heat break that that was mounted in. Uh, it's got a new PTFE tube. All the bearings are fully lubed up. I've got the angled part cooling fan mount and a new super pinder probe. And while I was at it, I also gave it a brand new 0.6 millimeter steel nozzle and a proper textured PEI sheet. It prints beautifully. It actually prints really nice. 
Uh, this printer has been properly mistreated and neglected, most of it not by me, and it's now back in perfect working order. It's now back in its stock configuration. The auto has been unpimped. And arguably, for me at least, this is the best possible configuration of the Prusa Mark III. No weirdness, nothing to worry about, just slice your files with the stock Prusa Slicer profiles, chuck the SD card into the printer, and reliably get parts out. This really is the recipe that makes me use the Mark III more than any other machine that I have. Is it the best and the most advanced 3D printer? No. Is it the one that I enjoy using the most? Yes. And I think I need to point out one thing here. I'm not saying that this is the best printer out there, or that it's the best printer for every use case, or even that I'm recommending that you should get a Prusa over other choices. Though some people certainly make it sound like that's what I do, but I don't. If you want a machine to tinker with, get one of the many Ender 3 variants. They're pretty solid printers to start with, and there's a huge community when it comes to mods and upgrades. Sure, all the doors for that are open on the Prusas as well, but I'm not sure if you're actually going to be improving the printers or the overall experience by changing and modding things here. Likewise, if you're using 3D printers commercially and need more than what these guys can offer, certainly get something better suited to those needs. What I think needs some acknowledgement too is how long Prusa has been around and how much their contributions have added up in the 3D printing space. Arguably, without the first Prusa Mendel, which back in the day was a version of the sales Mendel that people could actually reasonably build, without that printer, who knows if 3D printing would have even taken off like it did. And if you take a closer look, the designs of 99% of the printers out there right now is based on the Prusa i3 design, or the Mendel 91, which likewise is also based on Prusa's designs. Many of the improvements that are starting to become mainstream now, like coded PI sheets, auto leveling, the filament runout sensor, silent trinamic drivers, or power loss detection, etc. Those were made popular in the first place, you guessed it, by the more recent commercial Prusa machines. How much you want to value that historical aspect of it is up to you. But what's definitely more tangible is how much effort Prusa are putting into their machines, even the ones they've already made the sale on. These Mark III's are now quite different printers than when I first got them. They've seen countless firmware updates that improved reliability, added features, or simply made for a better user experience. The same is true for the Slicer. There is just one single version of Prusa Slicer that supports everything back to the old Mark II, and even on that machine, you still get all the improvements that each update brings along. Now, I get that those are all things that are quite hard for a brand new manufacturer to match. I mean, they can't possibly have a track record of still supporting printers half a decade old or having already set trends that shaped the 3D printing industry for the better. Promises are easily made, but time has shown that they're even easier to break. So when someone new comes along and makes bold claims, I naturally get suspicious. It's great to finally see something new, like the Bamboo Labs or Anchor Machines in the sea of practically identical Ender 3 clones. But with great promises also come great expectations, and at the very least, I expect the user experience and ease of use of what is supposed to be the new gold standard to be on par with what I'm used to from these old boys. So far, on the printers that I've used, I think it's still unmatched, which is why I keep using these. But I'm very excited for the day that someone manages to one-up the game. Thanks for watching, keep on making, and I'll see you all in the next one.